virtual lecture series. Uh, for those watching um, here on Zoom Live, you're more than welcome to use the chat feature. For those brothers out in Facebook land, which we are live streaming to right now, uh, feel free to throw your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll talk more about that later, but we will try to get to any uh, questions or thoughts or anything like that uh, later on. So we're just going to give it another minute uh, for any last minute brothers to join up and we will get started with the evening. All right, I think we have winners and we may have a couple here in a minute, a minute. come on. We are honored to have you back for the second installment of our virtual education series uh, brought to you as part uh, of the bicentennial celebrations for the Grand Lodge, Missouri, and on behalf of the Masonic Education Committee in the Grand Lodge. Uh, at this time, uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our guest host for the evening, uh, Right Worship Brother Ty G. Trotler, the Deputy Grand Master of the Grand Lodge, Missouri. Right Worshipful Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jacob. Most Worshipful Grand Master, Most Worshipful Brothers, Right Worshipful Brothers, brethren and guests, welcome to the second installment of the Bicentennial Lecture Series entitled, Light Settles in Missouri a look at the early proceedings of the Grand Lodge of Missouri. To most of you, I say good evening, but to our friends joining us in the United Grand Lodge of England, I say good morning. Our lecture tonight will feature Right Worshipful Brother Jacob Thompson, Grand Order, to discuss the happenings, events, interactions, and brothers who shaped the early Grand Lodge of Missouri. We'll explore some of the more interesting accounts of actions taken news of lodges opening and closing and a look at the men who made it all happen. Also, we wish to really emphasize that when the lecture is completed, we are going to have a, pretty much an open mic question and answer period. You're welcome to post your answers on the chat. You're welcome also to ask them directly, but please stick around for that because we will be here for that. To set the stage, the Grand Lodge of Missouri was formed in April of 1821 and the state of Missouri was formed in October of 1821. So just to confirm, the Grand Lodge is older than the state. Kind of drives the state a little bit crazy, but that's the way it is. It's really important that you realize this because when you review the early proceedings of the Grand Lodge of Missouri, you quickly realize that you were also reading the history of the men who formed the state of Missouri. Sorry, I got a little feedback on that one. Always remember that a lodge and therefore the Grand Lodge is actually the men who comprise it. Whether it be Freemasons such as Edward Bates, William Clark, Hamilton Gamble, or Alexander McNair, McNair Freemasons and Freemasonry were here to write the state constitution, serve as the first governors and officials, and create the state seal. It was almost a decade ago that the genesis of this bicentennial began. We were determined to break the mold of other celebrations and to present the bicentennial over a period of time rather than one large event and to fully incorporate the ideas and plans of local lodges and districts throughout the state. This bicentennial lecture series is part of the ongoing bicentennial celebration that will bridge two Masonic years and includes live events, an upcoming tour book, a bicentennial book with a reprint of the original centennial book and a commemorative jewel and some other surprises along the way. The underlying theme of the bicentennial has been to use our history to reflect upon the decisions that we might make to bring us through the next 100 years, to use our past to build a future for future generations of Freemasons. 
a decade ago, we did not foresee the events that now confront our fraternity. We survived the pandemic of the last century. We are now confronting the pandemic of this century. We have taken actions to protect our lodges. We are preparing for future generations. We will meet again and we will return to the work of the craft. Right Worship Brother Thompson, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, brethren, uh, good evening. It, it is a pleasure again to be back. Um, throughout the course of this lecture series, I have uh, the opportunity to be able to present on a, several topics. Um, some I, I, I at least feel generally very confident about um, in, in my knowledge and understanding. Um, this is a topic that I, I can easily say I would defer to many other brothers um, as the early proceedings of the Grand Lodge, our early leadership, um, there's so many facets to it. There's so many amazing stories about these men uh, that, that I can't truly do them the full breadth of justice. Um, so tonight, my goal is hopefully to uh, paint a little bit of a picture of the early years. Um, some of the things that are of, of the proceedings, um, some things I found interesting, and, and just give you a rough idea of uh, some of the early happenings. Um, in this modern day and age, we think so much of, uh, of the Masonic administrative system and Grand Lodge and our lodges uh, being so interconnected because of the internet, because of, of modern technology. Um, you know, we can go to Grand Lodge, uh, the office complex, we can go to an annual communication and, and it doesn't take half a day to get there uh, or less in most cases. Uh, we don't live in the time where uh, you had to hop on a train or a horse or be gone for if you were active in the Grand, your, Grand Chapter and the Grand Lodge, you could be gone for two weeks from home just to attend to those proceedings. So uh, we live in a different time, but I hope by looking at some of these things, um, we can perhaps scratch our heads and maybe find some interesting tidbits in it. Um, as Right Wars for Brother Ty mentioned, we will have some open Q&A afterwards, and, and I'm gonna defer to him at, and several others for input as we go forward on this. Um, and I'm sure I'm gonna to touch on a couple hot button issues uh, and questions perhaps uh, regarding lodge age and things like that. Uh, but these are all things that have been discussed before. And I, I see a couple smiles on the screen from some brothers who know where I'm gonna wander with that. Uh, so this time I'm gonna shut my video off and attempt to bring up the PowerPoint and we'll get started on this journey for the evening. I would remind brothers, uh, as you're on the call, please make sure you are muted. We are recording this and it is uh, going live to Facebook. So just a moment. Most Worship Brother, uh, Tim Thomas, can you give me a thumbs up if I've got a slide on your screen? Awesome. Sorry to call you out. I just saw you're the only video I see right now. Um, so, brethren, light settles in Missouri. A look at the early proceedings and happenings of the Grand Lodge of Missouri, and, and perhaps uh, a look at, at the actions of the early lodges and the brethren who, who composed those efforts. We've all heard the, the stories. We've all been privy to the the tales the legend the accounts of, of freemasons coming to to the new world coming to the colonies uh some of the earliest lodges on the rolls that we can find uh historically and we find record of are, are located in the colonies uh, but as civilization if you will and society uh, moved and grew and as the united states grew uh, across the country masonry followed with it and very often uh our brethren in the craft uh, carry the torch and the banner uh, that set the mark and the waypoint for social action, for community, uh, justice, and, and action of commerce and growth. 
Now, with Missouri and its early settling, we of course had that the influx of, of population and individuals who came uh, prior to the Louisiana Purchase, uh, whether they're of a French background, Spanish, or, or even English merchants. Um, in, in terms of an established Masonic presence, though, we, we really don't hear of much other than the three early lodges uh, of the 1800s, uh, one initially founded in St. Genevieve, uh, that's Louisiana Lodge number 109, uh, chartered by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. Uh, it was in existence from 1807 to 1818 or 1817, depending roughly on the records. Additionally, we hear of St. Louis Lodge number 111, chartered by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, in existence uh, from 1809 to 1810. Um, and then uh, what's known as Unity Lodge number six, chartered by the Grand Lodge of Indiana, uh, located in Jackson, Missouri. And, and Unity is an interesting lodge in itself. Uh, if you were to look at the records of the Grand Lodge and other places, uh, it seems to have been influenced by several Grand Lodges and, and hopped into existence and hopped out of existence very quickly uh, as it moved about. But those early lodges, those early presence uh, in terms of masonry were in the most populated areas, those, those centers of trade, St. Gene Genevieve, uh, the St. Louis area. Uh, those were heavily populated. They're on major trade spots in terms of population uh, moving up and down the Missouri, or the, excuse me, the Mississippi River, um, so it's natural that we would see brothers congregate in these locations. Of course, um, our brethren uh, in the early 1800s and, and perhaps in other parts of the world, they still hold to this. Uh, there's not a, a solid attachment to the idea of a lodge. So lodges would come into existence for a while and then fade. Uh, some longer than others, some very short, but they would come together uh, and not to say for a purpose, but, but for, for community. And they would, be sol they would be solvent, they would exist, and then perhaps the population would shift. Commerce would move elsewhere, uh, the leading brothers would leave the community, uh, and then it would waywardly disappear. Um, but as time dwells on, Missouri is growing, it's flourishing in the early 1800s as a, a frontier state. And three lodges are able to put down roots uh, after those early lodges. And that included Missouri number 12, um, which was chartered by the Grand Lodge of Tennessee in 1816. Uh, St. Charles Lodge number 28, chartered by the Grand Lodge of Tennessee in 1819. And Joachim Lodge number 25, also chartered by the Grand Lodge of Tennessee in 1819. We notice here that all three of those lodges are scions of the Grand Lodge of Tennessee. Um, prior lodges had been from the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. Intriguingly though, when we look at the actual membership makeup, the actual Masonic record and history of many of our early leadership, uh, you'll find uh, tinges uh, of Pennsylvania Masonry, but generally speaking, very strong Virginia Masons uh, for the most part at least born and raised in Virginia, uh, Masonically and, and in terms of their lives as well. But Masonry is going, it's moving, it's active. Uh, Missouri Lodge number 12, St. Charles Lodge number 28, Joachim number 25, they're, they're functional, they're existent. They both, they've all been around, you know, at least a few years. Uh, two since 1819, one since 1816, and they have very influential leadership. Men like William Clark, uh, the Blairs, um, and, and other figures who will become central to politics in this country uh, at one point or another, as well as the state, are all active in Lodge leadership. So several years pass by, um, and, and there's a decision, there's a discussion. It's promulgated by Missouri Lodge number 12 in St. Louis, um, that they wanna form a Grand Lodge. They wanna make an attempt to come together and form a Grand Lodge. So on February 22nd of 1821, three lodges meet. They send delegations on behalf 
of their respective lodges and they're invited to meet uh, by lodge number 12. The discussion is, is pretty clean cut and simple. They decide they, they want to form a grand lodge, but they need to get everybody on board and it needs to be agreeable to all of the lodges present. So a committee of three is organized to draft the constitution within two weeks. They have two weeks to draft this constitution and disperse it to the lodges for review. Um, it, it's interesting that we note that, that they have to disperse it for the lodges to review. And then uh, if ratified by those lodges, the past masters of the other, all three lodges will convene in April uh, to form this Grand Lodge, to finalize what needs to be done. The committee which drafted that constitution included brothers William Bates, representing Joachim, uh, Nathaniel Simmons, representing St. Charles Lodge, and Edward Bates, representing St. Louis, uh, and the Missouri Lodge number 12. Those three brothers come together and they draft a constitution. Um, and it's dispersed out to the lodges uh, for their review. Now, what's interesting, and I would highlight this process here just briefly because it became an adopted part of the Grand Lodge for its early years. Uh, and we see it here only referenced in the ratification of the constitution, but the constitution that was drafted by brothers Bates and Simmons actually laid out that any change to the bylaws of the Grand Lodge and its constitution had to be sent to all lodges by referendum approved by all those lodges and then come back to the grand body. Uh, if you think about that, um, it, it's almost an incomprehensible mountain to ascend to, to figure out how to get that referendum to pass. And, and it's noted in, in several histories of the Grand Lodge, the challenges that were faced in early legislation, trying to get things changed or adjusted uh, to work better, to be more functional um, because they, they just couldn't be ratified. You couldn't get the referendum to work uh, to get lodges to, to buy into it and apply themselves to it. But anyway, that, commi that committee drafts the constitution and they send it out. Um, and, it, and it's reviewed by all three lodges uh, who ratify it and send their delegations to St. Louis on April 23rd. Now, briefly, uh, just talking about these gentlemen who framed the Constitution, um, I won't dwell too much other than to mention uh, most of these men became pivotal, pivotal uh, in very particular facets of government, uh, as well as Grand Lodge leaders. Edward Bates was the Grand Master in 1825, 1826, 1827, and 1831. Um, William Bates uh, was a noted politician, and Simmons was a politician as well. Um, I, I want to quickly throw this, though, uh, to Right Worship Brother Ty. Uh, if, if you could enlighten everyone, what else did these three men help write? Well, Edward Bates was instrumental in the writing of the Constitution of the state of Missouri. There was a deadlock for several weeks, and no one could agree on the Constitution. Now, we have to understand that Edward Bates, at the very nicest, could be described as prickly. So he decided he was going to do it. So in one evening, he sat down with William Pettus, who eventually became uh, one of the officers of the Grand Lodge, and our second Secretary of State, because the first one disappeared one day to go gold mining somewhere. And he sat down and dictated it out of his head and in three and a half hours, wrote it out. Now, the reason we know this is that Frederick Billen was in the room and has a firsthand account of how our constitution came to be. As time went on, Edward Bates became the attorney general of uh, none other than Abraham Lincoln. And he created such things as the Presidential Powers Act and the expansion of uh, the president's ability to do things such as uh, uh, stop habeas corpus and other legal pieces. And it's only been recently discovered that it was his notes that actually formed the final version of the Emancipation Proclamation. 
Thank you, sir. So that really clearly sets us up to understand the, the important nature of these individuals. Uh, these were men that were well-known. They were effective leaders. Uh, they were highly respected. Um, and, and so they went to work framing the Constitution, uh, placing it before the lodges, and uh, setting, setting the craft to work. Um, now, before we, we talk a little bit about uh, the actual resulting activity that occurred because of that referendum and because of that comp, uh, Constitution, um, why don't we talk a little bit about where it all went down? where it all happened. Um, initially, the lodge in St. Louis, Missouri Lodge number 12, met in a building owned by William Clark. Um, and, and that building is where they met at least uh, in their initial moments uh, before later shifting to a property owned by Right Worshipful Brother Thomas Douglas. Brother Douglas had built a two-story building uh, seeing that Brother Clark's property had become unsuitable for the lodge's needs, they added a third story, an attic, to his building. Uh, and then that attic served as the lodge room uh, for Missouri number 12. And it was used by the lodge until the building uh, ceased to function as a lodge when the lodge closed in 1833. So it served as a Masonic lodge room. It also served the purposes of the Grand Lodge of Missouri in Missouri Royal Arch Chapter Number 1, which was organized in 1819. Uh, this room was the center focal point uh, of masonry from 1817 all the way to 1833 through our earliest and most formative years. On the corner of your screen, you see a, a really crude handwritten drawing. Uh, that comes from the Masonic Memoranda of Frederick Dillon, one of our early grand secretaries. Uh, it's a fantastic book that the Lodge of Research has been able to edit and put back together. And that's an illustration out of it uh, said to describe the layout of that attic. Um, but I, I wanna draft back just a moment to talk about the property prior to this, um, as well as this one. And I'm gonna lean again on Right Worth Brother Ty because he has a very interesting story about this building and, and the early homes um, we all need to remember, first off, St. Louis was a very different place in the early 1800s. Extremely different um, in, in terms of size. It was much more clustered along the river. Um, population was a little bit different. And, and the layout wasn't probably exactly what you think. Right, Worship Brother Ty? There's a note about the first lodge building that was built by Clark. And this is William Clark of, of Lewis and Clark. And the note when you hear it at first, it, it doesn't really strike you. And it takes a moment to actually understand what, what they said. That they were in the first vertical timbered building in St. Louis. And you stop and think about that, vertical timbers, that meant the rest of St. Louis was horizontal timbers. The rest of St. Louis was log cabins at that time. That's amazing to stop and think about. The entire city was log cabins and William Clark builds a building with vertical timbers like you would see maybe on the East Coast. And it was the very first time that was done in the city and it was done for the lodge. Very amazing story. Thank you. And, and so they started out in this, this <laughs> really the tallest building in town of sorts, if you will, uh, early on in the Grand Lodge of Missouri's history. Uh, was, was where that first initial lodge was meeting in St. Louis. Uh, and then, of course, shifts over to this building uh, that Brother Douglas built, also probably one of the more uh, extravagant homes, at least in height, uh, during that period, 1817. Uh, the city's still um, not nearly as big, still a frontier town of sorts. Uh, and that's where, like we said, uh, the Grand Lodge was formed. Uh, Missouri Royal Arts Chapter Number 1 was organized. Uh, and uh, brother and, and general, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, visited the craft while he was in the St. Louis area. Um, where that building and where Clark's building sat is now beneath the arch grounds uh, in St. Louis. I believe uh, the one building is basically near one of the legs. 
So the committee goes forward. Uh, the constitution is ratified. There's some initial meetings, um, some discussion, and uh, there's really some him hawing about leadership and who they're going to elect to be the Grand Lodge officers and what they're going to do to go forward, how they're going to function. Um, and, and not necessarily the first by election, but a brother by the name of Thomas Fivish Riddick is selected to serve as Grand Master. Um, underneath him, brothers Jason Kennerly and William Bates. We've already talked about Brother Bates. Uh, services Grand Wardens. Uh, the Grand Treasurer, Brother Archibald Gamble. Uh, another noted and well-known uh, politician, and the Grand Secretary, uh, Brother William Renshaw, our first Grand Secretary. Uh, these men are all elected. Uh, Riddick uh, assumes the Grand Mastership on the contingency uh, that he will only serve to the first annual communication uh, that is to be held later that year. Uh, so his term as Grand Master uh, is to be very short, um, really kind of helping get the Grand Lodge up on its feet, take those steps forward and see what can be done. So he's elected in April, he's installed May 4th, 1821 during what is called the first semi-annual communication. And the brethren process from the lodge room of Missouri Lodge, which is that building owned by uh, brother Thompson Douglas. And they moved to the Baptist church several blocks away where Brother Thompson Douglas presides and installs the officers. Now, Brother Thompson Douglas serves as the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge several years later. Um, and, and he's actually a pretty influential figure. You may ask, why is he, why is he important enough to install these officers? What perhaps has he done? Um, well, he's on record as having been a member initially of St. Charles Lodge number 28 uh, and, and was also a part of Missouri Lodge number 12. Um, he was extremely active, of course, in, in masonry. He's the guy who helped build the building in the attic, which the lodge would then meet in, and in which the Grand Lodge was generally considered to be formed. He was an army officer by occupation and served as the paymaster general uh, for the city and the military installations there. So May 4th, Thomas Fivish Riddick is installed as Grand Master, and the Grand Lodge begins that moment of, of, of taking a full breath. Um, and in that time, of course, they take some further action uh, and, and they follow up on that constitution by adopting some bylaws, by adopting some things that need to be uh, reviewed, some actions to be taken, and, and some of those little administrative things that, that fall, not really a constitutional idea, but a bylaw function. Some of the things they adopted that we would probably find interesting. Um, the Grand Lodge was going to meet twice a year. There would be a semi-annual meeting on the first Monday of April. Um, and then in October, uh, now the October communication would actually be called the Grand Annual Communication. So you'd have a meeting in April and that'd be called the semi-annual communication. And, and then the October, the Grand Annual. And those meetings would, would help transact the business uh, of the Grand Lodge. Uh, several Grand Lodges still use that type of a system where they have quarterly communications, um, things like that in their management. Of course, the Grand Lodge of Missouri, uh, for some time, uh, has worked under having one grand annual communication. Interestingly, they set the cost of dispensations, charters, uh, and some other contributions at this meeting. Uh, a dispensation could cost you roughly what's close to $500 today. Uh, a charter, while $10 then is almost $230 net now, um, every member had to contribute 25 cents to the charity fund, about six bucks, um, and 50 cents per member was contributed to the Grand Lodge every year. And then what's interesting here is that every member of the Grand Lodge and every visiting brother who attended Grand Lodge had to pay into the Grand Lodge about $23 in, in current money, but a dollar then just to attend. Uh, a bit of a registration fee, if you will, to cover costs of, of the meals and the candles and, and all those things. And if you consider, we're talking very much in the early years of the Grand Lodge, coffers probably weren't too full uh, to afford too much. Our first Grand Master who led us through this time, of course, being Thomas Fivish Riddick, 
Uh, he's just that handsome gentleman you see on your screen now. He was born in Suffolk, Virginia, 1781. Uh, and we know he's on the records of St. Louis Lodge number 111, uh, serving as the senior warden. At the origination of the Grand Lodge, though, uh, he is tied to the lodge at Herculaneum, uh, Joachim. And when he was elected Grand Master, he was 40 years old. Uh, he's an interesting individual because uh, of all the other people involved in the forming of the Grand Lodge, whether you're talking about the Bates, uh, the Gambles, all the others. Uh, while he is a well-known political figure, while he is a well-known citizen, uh, he doesn't have the weight that they do. Um, he, was the clerk of, he was the clerk of the Court of Common Pleas. He was the assessor of weights and measures. Uh, he served a short while as the recorder of land titles. And he was a representative to the territorial legislator at one point. Um, after his term as Grand Master, he left the St. Louis area directly, uh, just moving south to Jefferson County. And he died nine years later at the age of 49. Um, he's an extremely interesting figure uh, in his rise to serve the Grand Lodge, to serve his brethren and, and fill a great need as the Grand Lodge got its, its bearings Others who, who may have been selected uh, seem to shirk away for, for need of other responsibility and duties. Now, of course, uh, his leadership continues to October when they're going to elect uh, the next Grand Master as, as he had kind of agreed into. Uh, that first annual communication held October 1 of 1821 had 17 brothers in attendance the first day. We find that a dispensation was granted to Harmony Lodge number four in Louisiana, Missouri. And we're told that the Grand Lodge had uh, a little bit of money on hand. They had $96.50 in their general fund and 1975 in their charity. Uh, you can see those figures converted over to 2020 numbers uh, beside them. The Tyler for his services during Grand Lodge was paid $10. A couple of things I, I'd note real uh, briefly as we go forward when we talk about some of these communications. Sometimes Grand Lodge could go on for several more days than intended, perhaps, uh, if certain brothers weren't present, uh, if brothers who were expected to make a report hadn't arrived in town yet. Uh, you could easily see the Grand Lodge open, conduct some very brief business, and adjourn till the next day. Um, so that was not out of the realm of normal to see to see something be extended. Um, I did fail on one thing I wanted to do for this presentation. Um, I have the opportunity to work up in Louisiana, Missouri with my job, and I have seen uh, the dispensation for Harmony Lodge number four. Uh, it is in the possession of Perseverance Lodge number 92, um, and it is, it is a very neat piece uh, signed by Thomas Fivish Riddick and, and sealed uh, with a very unrecognizable seal, um, but they do have it in their possession. I plan to get a picture here just to kind of show you that, um, but uh, it is an interesting piece. It, it was handled and taken care of and issued by him in the interim between April and October uh, when it was mentioned at the October communication. Harmony Lodge lasted up until uh, the mid 1820s and, and folded. So, a couple days later, as we said, we open on October 1st. By the 5th and 6th, uh, time comes for the election of the Grand Master and the election of the Grand Officers. Uh, Frederick Bates is actually elected Grand Master first. Um, and Benjamin Emmons is elected the Senior Grand Warden. Both of these men uh, kindly... Uh, are contacted. Uh, they, they either weren't present or they weren't immediately in the area right when they were elected. So a committee was sent and appointed uh, to inform these brothers of their election. Both declined. Um, Frederick Bates, of course, was shortly thereafter uh, elected governor of Missouri um, and, and very active on a political front. So it could be seen why he may have turned it down. Following that point, of course, there was another election, and ultimately Nathaniel Tucker um, was elected to serve as Grand Master. Tucker um, was a judge 
in the civil courts there in St. Louis. Um, and his installation was presided over by Brother Riddick. Um, what is interesting here, though, is for the first time in our history within the Grand Lodge, we hear of a lodge of past masters being opened and the installation performed within it. Uh, this is the first reference to a lodge of past masters in the Grand Lodge's history and will follow us uh, in grand installations for some time till it's disused. Uh, the next year, the Grand Lodge is still growing, it's still evolving. And by this point, the Grand Lecturer is, is starting to kind of come into use. He's not listed as an official officer, but there is a brother appointed to be the Grand Visitor or Grand Lecturer, and they uh, pass a resolution to pay him at least $3 a day while he's engaged in this work. The next year, he, he submits a bill for $171 and change uh, for his services. Now, uh, the bug to be bigger and, and to build always bites Masons. It seems to hit in those most intriguing of times. And of course, the Grand Lodge is only open a year and there's already discussion of building Masonic Hall and looking to evaluate our expenses. Um, of course, at that time, St. Louis Masonry was very intertwined. The officers of Missouri Lodge number one and Missouri Royal Arts Chapter number one were, were basically mere copies. Um, and so committees were sent out to uh, discuss between them and move forward. Uh, what saddens my heart a little bit, well, I guess it's actually very fiscally responsible. The Grand Steward's bill for refreshments totaled only $5 or $112. Um, so it looks like it might've been a pretty slim meal or pretty good meal depending on how the economy was rolling at that time and what was in the St. Louis area available. Uh, but the Grand Stewards uh, taking care of that refreshment. Couple things happen as we move forward in the Grand Lodge's history. One thing I wanna point at, in the early evolution of the Grand Lodge, you couldn't just show up and watch what was happening. Um, one writer, uh, most worship brother Denslow uh, quotes it as people must have really been curious to see the mysterious workings of the Grand Lodge. Um, and so they actually charged you a fee to look in on the Grand Lodge, uh, the equivalent of 25 cents in 1824 or $7 today. Um, but time rolls on, the Grand Lodge starts out with those initial three lodges. They begin receiving requests to Charter lodges in other communities, um, lodges and brothers are seeking dispensations. Uh, and one of those lodges is Tyro Lodge. Tyro Lodge still exists and they put in a request for dispensation. Um, now what's interesting here is in the very early years of the Grand Lodge, when a lodge put it was under dispensation, they would actually have to bring all their records to the next annual communication. And those would be read or reviewed uh, in full detail. Um, to some extent, which is quite an ordeal, potentially. Uh, it could be quite lengthy uh, if it's not committed out. Uh, what, what's interesting, though, is those reviews usually found quirky things, um, odd practices, uh, weird, weird information, generally. Um, and in this case, when they were examining the records of Tyro Lodge, they found a couple problems, uh, at least in their mind. They found out that Tyro Lodge claimed to confer some of the high degrees. They said they had the right to confer high degrees. Uh, it doesn't say what degrees other than the past master's degree. Uh, so we're not entirely sure if they were claiming to be able to convey uh, the Royal Arch or uh, the council work or something like that. Uh, but they claim to be able to confer some high degrees. So that's, that's definitely more than just the past master degree. We also learned that upon a black ball being cast, the lodge could actually call out the brother who cast it and asked them to state their reason. Uh, and then of course they required all applicants for the degrees to be of a Christian faith. Now, all of those things popped up, a committee reviewed it and kindly Tyro was said, hey, um, we need to make some adjustments. And it was sent back to them uh, for their review and change. Um, of course, one of those big events in the early Masonic history of the Grand Lodge comes April 1825, the same year as that Tyro incident, when the Marquis de Lafayette is visiting the United States. Um, and he's going all over the country. He, he's making a big tour of it. He arrives in St. Louis. Um, 
at that moment when he gets to St. Louis, uh, Brother George H. C. Melody, right? Worship Brother Melody is is a early Grand Lecturer of the Grand Lodge. He's also the current Deputy Grand Master in that year. Um, calls together some officers, Grand Lodge or otherwise as past masters, um, and he pro tem opens the Grand Lodge in in the lodge room uh, of Missouri Number One. They're all gathered together. And he asked for a motion to elect Brother Lafayette to honor, honorary membership in the Grand Lodge. Now, at this point, the Marquis de Lafayette has had no contact really with any brothers in, in Missouri. Uh, they, brothers, just know he's in town. So they meet, they elect him to be a member of the Grand Lodge, and they send a committee to go wait on him, uh, brothers Edward Bates and several others. And they go wait on him at his hotel, uh, and they ask him to please, please come with us, come back to our lodge room. We'd like to, to meet you in Masonic Fellowship. The Marquis accepts and he and his son, uh, George Washington Lafayette, return to the lodge hall. Uh, once he's there, uh, Brother Archibald Gamble makes a stirring address um, to in respect to Brother Lafayette and his great services to our country. And after uh, the normal pleasantries and, and the replies, uh, the Marquis is escorted to the east, um, and assumably the way it's almost worded, placed in the east, uh, where his son was then elected an honorary member of the Grand Lodge as well. Following that, there's some more pleasantries and some thank yous and handshakes, and, and the Marquis leaves the brethren, uh, and they continue with their meeting closing up for the evening. Uh, but this all occurred in, in that attic that we talked about a little bit earlier, that attic uh, bro, uh, on the third story, if you will, or a partial story of Brother Thompson Douglas's building in St. Louis. So by 1826, the next year, the Grand Lodge is, is four years old. Since it's began, there's been eight lodges chartered uh, along with the initial three. So that's 11 lodges in existence. Yet things aren't always as good as they seem. Um, there have been several charters that were arrested. There were several that were lost um, to the first Grand Lodge of Illinois. Uh, and I say the first Grand Lodge because the Grand Lodge of Illinois formed once, closed, and then reopened again. Um, but several of the lodges that Missouri had helped form in Illinois went with that. Um, but at that point in 1826, there were only four lodges remaining, uh, including only one of the original initial lodges, uh, Missouri Lodge number one, Tyro Lodge number 12, Franklin Union seven, and Hiram number three all existed. Um, Hiram number three, a successor lodge in St. Charles, uh, and it closed actually later that year. Of course, uh, Time changes and, and the, the sentiments of the United States change. Uh, 1826, we, we see only three or four lodges left in the Grand Lodge. And that's really when the anti-Masonic feeling um, really started to sweep out of New York and across the country. Uh, the Grand Lodge still kept functioning. There were still lodges being chartered. Things were happening. Uh, but by 1833, the, the fever gets pretty severe in the St. Louis area. And Missouri Lodge number one meets with Edward Bates's master. They hadn't met for six months due to the cholera epidemic and, and some of the anti-Masonic feelings. Uh, we're told that there were many ministers uh, who were fiercely waging uh, a war against Masonic lodges and the ideas of masonry from the pulpit. Uh, so the lodge basically decides they're gonna settle their accounts, pay for their rent, uh, donate some money to the charity hospital, some to the library association. And then Brother Bates offers a preamble setting forth reasons to abandon work and a resolution to surrender the Grand Lodge, uh, the charter uh, of their lodge. And, and they do so and abandon Masonic efforts for the time being. Uh, that charter was restored uh, in 1842 along with the privileges of Missouri Lodge number one. Um, but what's interesting is between 1833 and 1842, masonry was not quiet in, in the St. Louis area, that biggest of population centers. Um, in the interim, there were at least two other lodges who picked up the torch 
1836, St. Louis Lodge number 20, and in 1839, Naphtali Lodge number 25. All were chartered and, and continued the work um, and made efforts uh, to keep masonry growing and functioning uh, as the other lodge at least was, was dormant and silent. Um, now, of course, all that happens and then very shortly thereafter, the annual communication of 1833 uh, the Grand Lodge decides that the sentiments and the uh, temperament of St. Louis is not good. So they're going to adjourn till December of that year and meet in Columbia. Uh, they meet at that session in December and the Grand Lodge formally votes to move itself formally to Columbia and find quarters in that city. Uh, if you go to Columbia now, uh, there is a plaque on the wall of a building downtown uh, that describes this story um, and, and explains that the Grand Lodge moved uh, to that city uh, during those years. Um, of course, the next year, even though they're in Columbia, the anti-Masonic feelings are so severe that the Grand Lodge, there's really no, uh, no desire to try to meet. The craft doesn't want to try to come into communication uh, as they, they feel that there's probably just too much risk and they don't want to endanger anyone. Um, time rolls on though, and, and several years thereafter, we hit the 23rd annual communication, uh, at which point they have adopted a new constitution. Uh, up until that point, they had been adopting various bylaws and revising things, but, but this new constitution uh, hopefully was, was going to shift away from that consistent having to ratify things uh, to all the lodges and every member and the things that have been so clunky. Uh, it made the Office of Deputy Grand Master elective, uh, which is, is a new piece. Uh, the Deputy Grand Master has, has had a very interesting role in the history of the Grand Lodge early on. Um, and it required that permanent members of the Grand Lodge receive that past master's degree and that the Grand Master submit a report of his transactions and activity. Um, additionally, this is when the Grand Lodge of Missouri gets the college bug. And they decide that the idea of a Masonic College of Missouri needs to be founded. Um, and the faculty is going to cover all these great topics, uh, things like mental and moral science, ancient language, uh, natural philosophy. Um, and they're going to do it free of charge besides room and board. And the Grand Lodge goes out and sets all these limits and these parameters. And, and it's very interesting that they're, they're so set on this idea. It's still very early in the Grand Lodge's history to some to some measure, uh, yet they're very much set in this idea of, we're gonna form a college, we're going to uh, do this, and we're going to you know, have some success with it. I mean, this is 1844, eight, or 18, early 1840s. Um, and from there, they, they work forward, they form the college, uh, and masonry grows. Um, in the 1840s into the 1850s uh, and expands um, with that new constitution in place with those new shifts. And of course, the Masonic College of Missouri and its efforts uh, originally in Philadelphia, Missouri, up in Marion County, later in Lexington, um, become the, the focal point for the Grand Lodge. Um, if I could say that there were two major topics uh, on the Grand Lodge's plate from the 1840s to the early 1860s, it is the Masonic College of Missouri, and it was the Baltimore Convention and Ritual. Um, and, and those truly occupied a, a vast amount of time in various chunks of years. Um, but here we see the early 1840s, the beginning of uh, this college and, and this idea of having these faculties. Uh, and what is interesting is when you look at the actual curriculum, um, this school would have been, uh, by measures of the day, uh, extremely uh, thorough. Uh, by some standard, you could say it would have even had an Ivy League setting, uh, at least in terms of its curriculum, and it, and it's was fairly ambitious uh, to be pursuing such a, a layout of coursework. Um, but that being said, uh, those are just some of the early happenings of the the Grand Lodge, and, and now we're going to touch on briefly um, a couple of the the more interesting tidbits and the breakaway points of time. The Grand Lodge, its names. All the other titles and honorifics. Um, 
oftentimes when, when we read about things and we read early accounts, uh, whether we're talking about masonry, uh, other Masonic bodies, uh, colleges, uh, anything, states, whatever you want to talk about, there's always name changes that happen over time. There's always shifts in perspective and, well, if we're going to look at it this way, we change to, to fit it. And, and the name of the Grand Lodge, its approach to honorifics and it, its approach to several other things are a couple interesting perspectives. Uh, the Grand Lodge's original constitution lays out that the Grand Lodge is to be titled the Grand Lodge of Missouri of ancient, free, and accepted Masons. Um, by 1843, uh, the Grand Lodge of Missouri incorporates itself with the state. And what's interesting here is that it calls itself the Grand Lodge of free and accepted ancient Masons of the state of Missouri. Uh, instead of AFAM, that's FAAM. Um, there's no general recorded use of that name outside of the incorporation, um, but that was the initial name of the Grand Lodge as incorporated. Uh, of course, even with that incorporation and the incorporations that followed as we began to own larger bits of capital and property and things like that, uh, we did shift more and more. The current name of the Grand Lodge being the Grand Lodge of Ancient, Free, and Accepted Masons of the State of Missouri. Uh, a slight change from that 1821 version, uh, but as Right Worshipful Brother Ty pointed out, the Grand Lodge or the state of Missouri didn't exactly exist when the Grand Lodge Constitution was uh, ratified. So the state of Missouri didn't exactly exist, but they were. So you could easily see why maybe the word state isn't in there. Now, of course, you might scratch your head if you've heard various things said at, at installations, perhaps, and, and other places and say, well, shouldn't it be the most worshipful Grand Lodge? Well, that's interesting. Um, in 1847, our, our good friend, Right Worshipful Brother Frederick Billen uh, is one of the first to apply the title of Most Worshipful to the Grand Lodge's name. Um, prior to that, it, it really wasn't used at all. And it marks the first instance of the Most Worshipful designation towards the Grand Lodge and, and the communication itself. Um, of course, after his time, uh, Anthony O'Sullivan does much to standardize the use of honorifics and titles. Uh, and, and how it's used. Um, now, when we talk about honorifics, it's interesting in that some early proceedings of the Grand Lodge of Missouri follow uh, what I would call, I believe, uh, more of a Scottish sentiment where the honorific follows the office. Uh, so more worshipful grand master, right worshipful grand order. Um, and, and you're still brother, brother Bob, brother Tim. Uh, so that interesting shift uh, in how it's used could sometimes be up to the author, uh, be up to the recorder, be up to the secretary, whoever's writing uh, the account. Um, references in, in 1838, actually at one point, uh, multiple places refer to the Grand Master as just the Worshipful Grand Master. Um, so there's no real early parameter on right Worshipful or most Worshipful or anything like that. Uh, in fact, most early proceedings uh, will kind of flip-flop a lot of different things. Um, so by the 1860s, when Anthony O'Sullivan becomes the Grand Secretary, um, he does standardize a lot of that. What is interesting to all that standardization is the one piece that is still somewhat in place. Um, and that's the shift in, in some of our terminology with our grand officers, uh, whether we call them Grand Senior Warden or Senior Grand Warden. Uh, that flip of the Senior Junior Grand uh, sentiment uh, flipped a lot, and it was pretty um, all over the place up until the 1920s, uh, when it seems to have settled down. Uh, yet, if you look in the current numeration of officers, you will notice that our Grand Wardens are still the Senior and Junior Grand Warden, but the Deacons are the Grand, Junior, or Senior Deacon. So um, standardization across the board uh, may be so vocally, uh, but still on paper, uh, just a tad bit scattered. Elections and nominations. Um, briefly on this one, uh, we all live in, in a mindset of a very democratic world and, and our fraternity being a great representation of servant leadership and, and elected uh, guidance. Uh, what we find is, is very early on, um, 
it was not out of the place to see brothers who had served uh, in one office jump several chairs. Uh, it, brothers who served maybe as a senior grand warden go straight to being grand master. Uh, the deputy grand master, it wasn't, it wasn't an assured deal that you would be elected. And, and very often uh, you could almost in at least several periods have nominations from the floor of individuals for office. Um, uh, what comes to mind briefly uh, is the election of John Fletcher Houston as Grand Master in the early periods where he had served as a Grand Lodge officer uh, for some time, was out of the line. So he was a, a brother, uh, if you will, a general brother of the craft, and he was elected from the floor. Um, he was not in the line uh, to serve as Grand Master. Uh, he had served as a, a, a Grand Warden, I believe, and Navy Deputy Grand Master, but he he was not in the line at the moment of his election. Um, Missouri's military lodges. Uh, Missouri has always had an interesting stance towards military lodges, not really taking action on them to charter them. And we've had several grand masters who've went to great lengths uh, to condemn them. Uh, but what's interesting is, is one of our own grand masters, most worship brother John Rawls, uh, was the colonel of a regiment about to head off into the Mexican War. Uh, and he took it upon himself uh, to charter Missouri Military Lodge number 86, um, also referred to as Missouri Militia, 3rd Regiment, Missouri Volunteer Lodge number 86. Uh, you talk about a mouthful to say during opening. Um, it was instituted in June of 47 in Independence as the regiment was about to leave. Um, records show that it arrived in Santa Fe, and when it was there, it did receive petitions and it conferred degree work. Um, with several of the officers of the regiment serving as officers of the lodge. Uh, we know it existed for at least, you know, a year or so, um, as the last entry in their proceedings is July 5th of 1848, where it notes most worship brother Rawls as the master. Uh, the minutes book of that lodge is in the possession uh, of the Grand Lodge. Uh, and I know they have that there. Uh, I'm sure most worship brother Hess would love to show it to anybody who'd be interested in at least seeing a little bit of it. The use of the past master's degree we've talked on briefly. Um, it, appear, it appears very early on in our Grand Lodge history, uh, that first grand annual communication of October 1821. And that's how they'd install the Grand Master. Um, they would take, he would go into a quote unquote separate uh, installation after which they'd install everybody else. Um, and they installed the Grand Master like that for some time. And it prevailed pretty consistently up until 1853 after which it falls out of active use by the Grand Lodge in its installation of officers. Yet it remains on the books. And to be a master of a lodge, you have to have had received it up until 1895. Uh, what we find though is probably from about the 1860s all the way up to that 1895 point, there have been attempts to get it abolished, to get it removed, to get it set aside. Uh, it wasn't always happening. It wasn't always occurring in the proper manner. Um, there were several uh, extended issues, uh, per se, with brothers who had received the virtual past master degree in Royal Arts Chapters, um, who were assuming uh, privilege. Uh, so there was a lot of issues with it. And, and finally, in 1895, they were able to get a resolution in place that abolished the requirement uh, and the recognition of it. Last couple of comments are just gonna be about on Missouri's early ritual and then we'll open the floor for discussion. Uh, as we said early, earlier, Missouri kind of had a hodgepodge of, of lodges in, in terms of what was early chartered here. Whether we're talking about the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania or later the Grand Lodge of Tennessee, we have Virginia Masons, we have California, or excuse me, Carolina Masons, uh, Tennessee Masons, brothers from Indiana, Kentucky, all coming into St. Louis. Uh, Herculaneum, St. Charles, all these big river towns. Um, so what ritual was going on? What do we know? Um, we do know from at least one or two accounts that several Missouri brothers in as early as 1816, so this is right around when uh, what became Missouri Lodge number one was chartered, several Missouri brothers met with men like Thomas Smith Webb and Jeremy Lag Cross, uh, who are well-known traveling lecturers of the early 1800s. They met with them in Cincinnati and Louisville. And while they were there, they obtained and carried with them back to Missouri, correct knowledge of the Master Mason, the Royal Arch, the Royal and Select Master's degree. 
Um, what's interesting from that, uh, that 1816 date tags pretty well uh, to the early Missouri masonry. Uh, it also tags really well to early Royal Arch masonry. It does not line up with uh, any Royal and Select uh, masters, any councils, anything like that in Missouri, as none of, as most of those bodies weren't formed for another 30 or 40 years in the state. Uh, additionally, uh, a throwback to that name I mentioned earlier, George H.C. Melody, um, one of our early grand lecturers, was actually a direct student of Webb um, or potentially a, a, one of his direct proxies. George Melody uh, was in Albany, New York for some time, and he is said, he's on record to have said and several other accounts push that he was taught by Thomas Smith Webb the ritual. Um, and he served as the, one of the grand lecturers early on for some time. Uh, so we can easily say there's a pretty strong connection to Thomas Smith Webb ritual prior to the Baltimore Convention. Of course, Missouri and her landmarks, uh, interestingly, with all, all those uh, early developments, uh, those early influences, uh, you might scratch your head. Was it the Amon Reason? Was it Anderson's Constitutions? Who was the guiding light? Uh, we really don't see it pointed out a lot in the early constitutions uh, or early records. If it is, it, it's done very coyly. Um, but by 1853, there's a committee who reports uh, with some instructions to print 6,000 copies of the Grand Lodge constitutions. And they need to include uh, Anderson's material, his old charges, his old regulations. Um, and then that they need to be dispersed to the lodges and then every lodge should collect 25 cents from every master mason who will then buy a copy. Um, that, that was a motion made. Uh, that's also the same year that the Grand Lodge of Missouri reaffirms its stance that the Anderson's con or reaffirms for the first time in, in full writing uh, that Anderson's constitutions are the landmarks of the Grand Lodge of Missouri. Now, uh, circling back to Brother Melody, just briefly, uh, Missouri was one of the great active participants in the Baltimore Convention. Um, as I said, that, that ritual came to Missouri. Uh, it was in the hands of, of guys like George Melody, um, some of those early brothers in St. Louis. Um, and, and so there's a big tie to probably Thomas Smith Webb's work early on. Um, by 1843, uh, there were a lot of questions. This is that same time frame as uh, the Masonic College. So like I said, 1840s and 1850s were basically swallowed up with two big things in development, the Masonic College, uh, and ritual in the Baltimore Convention. 1843, uh, there are attempts to, to do some type of big meeting, big convention where all the Grand Lodges of Missouri can come together. Uh, some people see it as a veiled attempt to create a general Grand Lodge. Others see it as, as a smart move for uh, bringing some sense to everything and putting up some defensive actions against anti-Masons. Missouri authorizes to send two brothers uh, who are going to split expenses. So the Grand Lodge will pay for one guy, but you got to split the expenses, um, basically is what they do. And they send uh, two future Grand Masters, Colonel Stephen Webster Barnes Carnegie and uh, Joseph Foster. Along with those brothers, uh, Frederick Billen and Hiram Chamberlain go along on their own dime out of their own pocket. Uh, both of those men are Grand Lodge officers or are involved with the Grand Lodge leadership, uh, but uh, it does not include in that delegation the Grand Lecturer. Um, he had moved to New Orleans due to some ill health uh, and did not really return to the state of Missouri uh, after that. They come back um, with the Baltimore work, but, but as they set out to go to Baltimore, the Grand Lodge actually puts in place an order uh, basically saying to the grand visitor or the grand lecturer, don't teach anymore, no more lecturing, no more instruction uh, on the ritual, hold until the convention in Baltimore is done, and we have some firm answers on what happened there. And they do that. The brothers go, they participate in the Baltimore convention, and they come back. And when they come back, they participate in what I would call a ritual um, fiesta, they begin on Friday at 10 a.m. and they work till 2 p.m. Uh, chugging away at the exemplification of the ritual. And they go through it all. They make as big of an attempt as they can. 
showing all the detail, covering all the lectures, making sure that everything is tip top, uh, on point, uh, and make sure everybody understands exactly what's going on. The end result, of course, is that the Grand Lodge adopts the ritual. Um, and it adopts it uh, in full, except for one part. They adopt the entered apprentice degree in full, the fellow craft degree in full, but they only adopt the first portion of the master mason degree. Uh, they only adopt the first portion of the master mason degree. The second portion uh, retained for uh, posterity, um, or if you not posterity, but it retained. Uh, generally, the opinion is it was retained uh, due to its similarity, uh, or at least the holding similarity of the brothers involved uh, to the Pennsylvania version of their third degree uh, and Missouri's wanting to adhere to that. So my last uh, closing little tidbit I wanna share with you brothers um, is this list. These are the lodges that are still left from the early years. I define the early years as 1821 to 1825. Um, and as such, um, it covers quite a spread. St. Louis, Missouri Lodge, number one, chartered in 1816. Uh, uh, everybody, if you remember earlier, I mentioned uh, St. Louis, number 20, formed while number one, after number one had surrendered. Uh, it did end up merging into number one. Tyro Lodge, uh, Palmyra Lodge number 14, Naphtali Lodge number 25, St. John's Lodge number 28, uh, going down the list. These are all lodges still existing in the Grand Lodge of Missouri, chartered before that point. Um, and there's some interesting uh, things we can glean from this list, brothers. Uh, there's some very interesting concepts we can glean. Um, first off, I, I would point out, because uh, I know there'll be somebody here who's going to argue with me about uh, number one, uh, that's inevitable um, since they did surrender their, char or their charter at one point and then we're back. Uh, Tyro Lodge as well has had a charter, I believe, arrested at one point. Um, so both of those you could say maybe are not quote unquote continuous. Uh, to my knowledge, Palmyra and Naphtali Lodges uh, have not ceased working at, at any point in their history. Um, and going through the rest, I couldn't tell you. Uh, but these are all lodges with some fantastic history, um, and, and they cover a, a vast portion of the state. The reason I give you this list, my brothers, though, is for this next part, this map. You see on your screen all these stars, and these are representative of every one of those lodges on that list. Now, you can see a couple things there, uh, perhaps, in terms of trends. Um, you can see river trends along the Missouri River. Uh, you can see several rail line trends, um, as well as along the Mississippi River. Um, all of these are representative of that. And you can tell where the early Grand Lodges were, or where early lodges in the Grand Lodge were founded, uh, whether we're talking about, you know, along the Missouri River, uh, we're talking up here along the Missouri, if we're talking along the Mississippi River going down, we're talking about rail lines that head south, north, um, that cut across. Uh, you can see the patterns of traditional movement. What you do notice, though, is the gap way down yonder here in the south. Everybody kind of notices that. If you'll remember from my discussion on uh, the Grand Lodge of Missouri during the Civil War, uh, we spoke about Brother Anthony O'Sullivan in the 1860s. This map stops in 18. 55. Uh, if you remember the map from the other uh, presentation, you note how many lodges were down here that were closed. Um, between 1855, 1860, they chartered a plethora of lodges down here that all, uh, as our grand secretary at the time said, uh, were founded uh, in places that didn't have the people, the money, uh, or the dedication. He put it in a much more crass way than I would, uh, but, but that's paraphrasing it. And of course, the Civil War did literally to keep those open. But early Grand Lodge trends, you can see uh, the outflow of lodges.
sake, and then we'll close the questions. The word, the code. Um, outside of Missouri, we don't, or inside of Missouri, we don't, inside of Missouri, we do not use the word, the code often. Um, I know a lot of Grand Lodges that when they refer to their bylaw, their manual, uh, they call it the code. Um, if you were to search uh, any Grand Lodge text, any books published prior to probably the 1920s, uh, at least earlier than 1910s for sure, you'll see references to the code. Uh, it pops up in use from about the 1880s forward. Um, maybe even a little earlier, you'll see references. But when they talk about the code, they're referencing our bylaws. Uh, it's just a term that's fell out of use in Missouri. Additionally, what's interesting uh, is the reference to ancient York Masons. Uh, we don't really call ourselves that anymore so much, uh, but several early Grand Masters, uh, Brother Hamilton, Most Worshipful Brother Hamilton Gamble and several others use that as a form of address frequently to the Grand Lodge, um, perhaps a remnant uh, of our association with the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. Uh, the other thing, if you're ever digging through early proceedings, uh, the differences between the words mode of work and ritual. Prior uh, till really about the Baltimore Convention, anytime they talked about what we would call ritual, uh, they'd refer to it as mode of work, at least in the United States, uh, because it wasn't word perfect. It wasn't expected, generally speaking. Um, so your modes of work were, were the basics of what you do. It wasn't the exacts. Uh, as we came and shifted into a word perfect ritual system, if you will, uh, the word ritual was much more referenced instead of mode of work. Um, and you'll note, interestingly, brothers, if you were to look in the Grand Lodge Constitution and bylaws today, under the duties of the Dip District Deputy Grand Master, uh, he is uh, empowered to correct, I'm, I'm going to mess this up, so somebody will slap me later for it, uh, correct and, and instruct in the modes of work. Uh, that description of his job duties uh, is extremely old and predates uh, the district lecturer system. Um, an interesting remnant of his wants, his authority wants to work within the ritual and instruct in it. So with that being said, this is, like I said, a, a very uh, skim level look at the early proceedings of the Grand Lodge, some of its happenings, um, and some of the things were uh, cogs in the wheel that got the Grand Lodge moving forward through its first 30 or 40 years as it happened, and some of those big pieces around it. Uh, with that being said, we'll open the floor for questions uh, and any discussion or any thoughts uh, anybody has. So a couple comments from out in uh, the chat uh, real quickly. Um, what is a dispensation? Uh, brothers may not have heard of that so much. Uh, when you talk about a lodge that's under dispensation or UD, uh, it is a lodge uh, preparing to be chartered. So dispensation is the formal authorization for them to uh, make that attempt to work and, and open um, and go through that process. Is that probably the best definition, uh, Brother Grand Secretary? Uh, he's yes good deal um yes lafayette was touring the united states at that time uh most worship brother hess our, our grand historian notes that i would actually point out an interesting story that i read yesterday um, when he actually arrived in philadelphia i guess there was some question um regarding the fact if he was a regular mason or not um, because of the situations in france and so they actually had to have a meeting and, and i i don't remember the exact process they went through but basically they passed a resolution that said we're going to acknowledge him for what he is and, and hope it works uh, more or less is, is the the short way about it um that would be correct yeah thank you um, and most worship brother Hess does point out there are some documents on masonic college i'd encourage anybody who's interested in it uh to check that out um additionally there is a book if you're a missouri mason your lodge probably has it uh, on the masonic college of missouri it's very short um, it's good. It's, it's an interesting read because it, it, it shows you the uh, tribulations, all the, the hoops that went on and, and 
it was a big endeavor when they took it on. It really was a neat project, but it was, they really thought they were going to hit the ball out of the park. And I think when it all finally started clicking together, they realized how much of a challenge it really was. Wasn't it pretty much destroyed in the battle of Lexington? Um, it, it was, well, the building was, was heavily damaged. What, what's, there's a couple other factors to that. Um, first off, uh, the college had been shut down for a couple of years before that. It was, ba it, it was basically an empty building at that moment. Um, there had been issues up late 1850s up. Um, there had been some challenges with the subscriptions, with getting people there, upkeep costs, that type of deal. And, and basically it was, it was a shutdown building at that moment. Not to say it was completely gone, but um, 61, uh, 1860, 1861, they were trying to cash out all the subscriptions and, and dispense of the property. And the state, if I'm thinking correctly in my timeline, the state had actually taken possession of the property informally prior to that. They had agreed to buy it and they were gonna operate a college themselves. And, and then of course the war <laughs> kind of uh, adjusted political sentiments and it didn't exactly occur, but it was, it was damaged. There's, there's a, a couple really good black and white pictures that I have stumbled upon. And I think I have one in the last uh, presentation we did that, that has the front of the building and you can see some nice big chunks out of it. Um, Josh Herbig, worship brother Herbig mentions the original Grand Lodge met in the building associated with Clark. Uh, but Meriwether Lewis was the first master of St. Louis Lodge number 111. Yes, correct. Very, very much so. And five Kish Riddick was his senior warden. Yes, yes. And, and, and Riddick really, uh, for the individual he was, for stepping up to the plate as he did to do what he did, um, he was an extremely active public servant. I, I've heard an interesting story that he may have potentially been associated with the Grand Lodge elsewhere, um, but I don't know if that's 100%. I, I haven't heard exact details on that beyond some base accounts, um, but he was extremely active in, in some administrative roles. He wasn't a big politician per se. Um, and then of course, you know, he did that at 40 and then he moves out of the city and, and dies nine years later. So um, it, it was quite a, quite an interesting ordeal. Um, any other questions? I'm, I'm checking the uh, Facebook page right now as we, we go. So there's a good question here, actually, and I actually will admit I, I spoke with several brothers right before this call. Uh, the brethren of St. Charles Lodge want to know, um, was there much known debate or argument regarding Anderson's and the regulations as the official trademark, as opposed to other works or independently codified lists? Um, so uh, of course, we passed that resolution in 1853. Uh, that resolution comes at an interesting time. Uh, that same year, there was a massive infight uh, with Scottish Rights Supreme Councils uh, based on um, oh, the northern jurisdiction, the southern jurisdiction, and spurious bodies. Uh, but they were also, and part of that ordeal with that situation was infighting in Carol South Carolina and Louisiana. Both of those states had ancient Grand Lodges and modern Grand Lodges, um, and it was causing massive rifts. So if you look uh, in the proceedings um, of that year, you'll actually find in the, in the Committee of Correspondence a bunch of entries talking, uh, and they don't directly say it. There's a lot of reference to ancient Grand Lodge issue and modern Grand Lodge issue and, and this being spurious and this being regular. Um, it, it was a hugely hotly debated and contested issue uh, of what was adopted and what wasn't. Um, sensibly, uh, if we had our early lodges, perhaps the, the Amon Reason, uh, McDermott's text was used as a, a base found, founding point. Uh, Tennessee generally is adhered to Anderson's. Uh, so that would have been the main thing that fell into our hands uh, in terms of the early lodges that came to form the Grand Lodge. Um, I, I think timing, it just, it was just when the line in the sand was being drawn. 
and Grand Lodges were, were basically saying, we're siding on this end of the world in terms of the battle, um, if you will. And, and by battle, I use that loosely. Uh, but at least in the United States, the situation between moderns and ancients was only in a couple states, and it was leading to just bickering and, and, and throwing of eggs and rotten tomatoes and everything else. Um, I think we've already addressed this, but what happened to Masonic College, it, it did close. It was originally in Philadelphia, Missouri, on a very expansive campus. Uh, they shifted it then to Lexington. Uh, at the time, Lexington had the largest lodge in the state, I believe at that moment. Um, they lobbied for it and it actually, the building occupied the highest point in the city overlooking the Missouri River. Um, so uh, that's that was that, let me. Um, And that, Mike Dodd brings up a good good point there. He, he finds it interesting, the background of the early officers and the different lines of work. Uh, they really are, it's, it's an interesting makeup. What you find is, is there's a lot of lawyers, uh, a lot of government politicians, but there's a lot of educators. Um, there's a lot of merchants that are, are very varied in their background. Um, but, it, but it definitely shows um, if they're government, they're all over. I mean, it's not like guys from one set division of it. It's guys from all aspects, um, which shows a, a variation of backgrounds um, and skill sets. Um, and, and Brother Scott, if you want to shoot me an email after this call, I'll throw my email in the chat and, and I can get you some resources. Uh, any other questions? Once, going twice. I've got one more. I love Go the ahead. fact that I love the fact that there is a Wakanda Lodge, but I'm wondering where did that name come from because I was unable to find it. I uh, I don't know. I saw the same thing when I was actually typing that list up, um, and it's up around Carrollton. So is there? Lloyd Lyon was on the call. If he's still on. He might have some insight. I'm the. Uh past master for that lodge. It's Walking Don. It's actually named for Walking Dog Creek, which is a creek that runs into the Missouri River. Oh, okay. Thank you, Horseful. All right, Horseful. Uh, uh, there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's the interesting thing. We have all these lodges that have been around so long. Um, we have all this history piled up. Uh, and it's interesting when we look at these interactions. One, one thing I didn't point out that I'll point out as a last little bit, and then I'll, I'll throw it back to our co-host to close up, unless there are any other questions. Um, the early proceedings of the Grand Lodge are, are very intriguing to read. If you can understand them in one reading, congratulations, you're better than most. Uh, because they're, they're, they're intriguing. Um, they use a lot of phrases we don't use, like a memorial was offered for so-and-so. Um, there are several sundry brethren at such and such a place. Um, they, they go about it a little bit differently, but what you find is, like I said earlier, they may open Grand Lodge, look around, complete one committee report and then close. And it may be a seven day annual communication um, because they're waiting on reports from somebody. Um, when you had lodges that were UD in the early years, they weren't sent to a committee. They were went over in full in front of the body. Um, there's exemplifications. That's something I really didn't hit on. Uh, but after the 1840s, it becomes real textbook. And even before that, it was done a little bit. The Grand Lodge officers were expected to walk through a degree, uh, to demonstrate a degree, to go through a lecture. Uh, that was all part of the experience of being in an annual communication. Um, it isn't unheard of if you look at the early proceedings to see like only two Grand Lodge officers there a couple times, uh, at least in one case, only one like the deputy grand master, uh, because of the traveling, um, because of business obligations, government uh, roles, uh, guys were busy. I mean, we're busy today, but these guys, they could be, it's a lot harder to travel on a horse in a day than it is in a car. Um, and so you'll often see a lot of officers being pro temmed. You'll see uh, positions, uh, guys being put into the uh, a chair the first time coming to Grand Lodge. Several guys. Um, I can think of examples of men who became grandmasters uh, very short into their quote unquote Masonic career, and they had 
they were master of a lodge and they showed up as the representative of their lodge and were the senior grand deacon <laughs> pro tem and the next year and they're and they get appointed to the credentials committee and just i mean all these committees at once now not say it, it'll blow you away um and it really is interesting um I, I would throw one little last story out and i wish i could remember who's involved i can tell you it was edward bates i can tell you the gamble both gambles were involved um, and I can tell you it happened before 1821. Um, but there was an article published up here in up in Pike County a couple weeks ago. They do a, a review of old newspaper articles. And they talked about how dueling was outlawed in the state of Missouri. And how one day uh, two parties showed up in Louisiana. They both came on separate boats, were dropped off on the shore. Louisiana was a huge river town at the time. They were dropped off on the shore. Uh, three men apiece got off in each one of these groups. Uh, they were all extremely well dressed. It didn't fit at all. It didn't make any sense why these guys would come to Louisiana. They came into the only bar that was in town and open at the moment, and they sat at opposite ends of the building, drinking and drinking and drinking. Um, finally, someone was able to pull it out of them that they were they were trying to look for a uh, a boat to take them across the river to an island. Uh, so they could take care of some business. They wouldn't say much else. Uh, it turns out it, it was a it was a pretty fiery little feud. The result was they got so drunk in the tavern that they made up, shook hands, got on the same steamboat, and went right back down to St. Louis. Um, the brothers involved in our Grand Lodge come from every spectrum of society, every political leaning, every part of government, um, and were the the foundation of our state as it came together. And the interesting stories you hear, things like that. And when I read it, and I really wish I would have made a copy of it. Um, I mean, it was guys who, when you look at the, the proceedings of the Grand Lodge, their names are in, in, in the same lineup of a stack of names of who's serving together. And yet they were very much prepared to go shoot at each other uh, for nothing more than, than an issue in a courtroom that they couldn't seem to handle normally. So. Different times, different times. But with that, thank you, brother, brethren, for your attention. Uh, my email is, is in the chat if anybody needs it. Um, and, and I now tender the floor uh, to Right Worship Brother Trotler. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Right Worship Brother Jacob. Great, great information. Um, John Kirby brings up an issue, and that is about, uh, let's see, was it St. Louis Lodge number 111? And What's interesting is that original lodges, 109 and 111, while they were here in Missouri Territory, weren't there when it came time to actually form the Grand Lodge. Frederick Billen came back from the war with England. They found the He's specifically referencing Lodge 111. And the war with England was the War of 1812. So what happened was all of this River Valley area, all the men went south to help Andy Jackson. They went down, they fought in the Battle of New Orleans, they came back from the war to find that their lodge had gone extinct. So being pragmatic, they thought, well, if we go and try to find 111 again, we're gonna owe several years of uh, returns and we're gonna have to go back to Pennsylvania versus we just served with Andy Jackson, who's now senior grand warden in Tennessee. So they went to Tennessee and that's how St. Louis 12 garnered its first charter. So there really isn't a direct connection between 111 or a direct connection between Pennsylvania and Tennessee. There's a break that happened in there. People have tried to connect that over to sometimes make us Missouri one a little older than it is, but it really is 1816 with Andy Jackson. Here's a funny postscript to the story and there's a letter on the wall in the museum, an actual true letter that's really there. By 1821, St. Louis 12 had not really kept up with its ability to pay its per capita either. So they figured creating a Grand Lodge they'd get out of that and they did. And they became Missouri number one. A couple of years later, the Grand Lodge of Tennessee came back and said, hey, you owe us some money. You owe us some returns and you haven't paid. So the Grand Lodge of Missouri writes Missouri one a letter. 
And they said, or they write a letter to Tennessee. And in the letter to Tennessee, they said, Missouri one is under our jurisdiction. You can't do anything to them. You can't demand money from them. You can't pull their charter. Then in the bottom of the letter, they write, Missouri one, you better pay Tennessee or we're gonna demand the money and we're gonna pull your charter. So that's the beginning of how everything started with all of this. And that letter is right up on the wall to read in the, grant, in the, in the museum over at the Masonic complex. So without any further comments or pieces, I wanna thank everyone for being here. And uh, thank you for, to the United Grand Lodge of England. I know you're out there somewhere, it's early morning. You can read what's gonna happen tomorrow and tell us. And I believe our Grand Master is still with us. The last word belongs to him. Most forceful Grand Master Barry Cunduff, are you there? I'm here, let me know if this uh, mic works. Can you hear me? Oh no, I can't hear you. Good, <laughs> this is a, a new home system. Hey, I appreciate everybody being here. While we can't do things in person, it is great to be able to see you all. I really enjoyed the presentation. I appreciate the work everybody's doing. I appreciate all of you being here, brothers from our state and from anywhere else. Uh, good luck, good help to all of you. I hope all of you are well, and I'm very happy to see you, and that's really all I have to say. Thank you, Grandmaster. Thank you, everyone else. Jacob, thanks for the time you put in. And so everyone knows Jacob's carried these first several ones, but we're not making him do them all. Well, maybe not yet. So thank you. Good night. Have a good evening, brothers. Any other further questions or anything going on, you can stick on the call for a few minutes, but otherwise we are done. <laughs>